like to welcome you to this program or this broadcast. This is part six in our series on Behind the Door. We have looked at and done this tape now twice, and both times it has not come out well. I believe that this is probably the strongest of all the tapes in the Behind the Door series. Before we get underway and proceed with this program, part six of Behind the Door, let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, as we seek to understand today in light of yesterday, we pray for the Holy Spirit to guide our minds in Jesus' name. Amen. In the book, Fifty Years in the Church of Rome by Charles Chiniqui, he states this, Rome saw at once that the very existence of the United States was a formidable menace to her own life. From the very beginning, she perfidiously sowed the germs of division and hatred between the two great sections of this country, and succeeded in dividing south from north on the burning question of slavery. Charles Chiniqui, an ex-Catholic priest, made it very, very clear right there that the Roman Catholic Church recognized from the very beginning of the United States of America that either America and her principles would take over the world or the principles of Rome would take over the world. It was an all or nothing battle between the principles of the Roman Catholic Church and the principles of the United States of America. In another work written by Samuel Morse, which was, it's called The Foreign Conspiracy Against the Liberties of the United States, and this is in the preface of Morse's great work. We read these words. The author undertakes to show that a conspiracy against the liberties of this republic is now in full action under the direction of the wily Prince Metternich of Austria, who, knowing the impossibility of obliterating this troublesome example of a great and free nation by force of arms, is attempting to accomplish his object through the agency of an army of Jesuits. The array of facts and arguments going to prove the existence of such a conspiracy will astonish any man who opens the book with the same incredulity as we did. Samuel B. Morse, the father of the Morse Code, wrote this book after visiting Europe and Rome in the 1830s and 40s. And in his work, he shows that there is a conspiracy going on against the constitution of this great republic of the United States. And that Clemens von Metternich, the prince of Austria would use the wily Jesuits to seek to destroy the principles of this great nation. In another document called The Footprints of the Jesuits by R. W. Thompson, he states this, the sovereigns of the Holy Alliance had massed large armies and had soon entered into a pledge to devote them to the suppression of all uprisings of the, pe pe of the people in favor of free government. And he, Pius VII, desired to devote the Jesuits to the accomplishment of that end. In another work by Burke McCarty, on pages 9 and 10 of her book, entitled The Suppressed Truth About the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln, she wrote this, The Congress of Vienna 
covering the whole year of 1814 and 1815, was a black conspiracy against popular governments at which the high contracting parties announced at its close that they had formed a holy alliance. The particular business of the Congress of Verona it developed was the ratification of Article 6 of the Congress of Vienna, which was a promise to prevent or destroy popular government wherever found and to reestablish monarchy where it had been set aside. Now what are Samuel Morse, R.W. Thompson, and Burke McCarty talking about? Let me put it to you in layman's terms. In the early 1800s, there was a man who was turning Europe red. His name was Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon Bonaparte was finally taken captive right around 1812, 1813. And shortly after that, in 1814, a congress was held in Vienna. The major countries involved in that congress were Austria, Germany, Russia, and Pope Pius VII. The primary goal of the Congress of Vienna in 1814 and 1815 was to devise a way to destroy constitutional government wherever it was found in the world. Any government that was granting to its people certain inalienable rights was to be destroyed. And the group that Pius VII thought would be most effective in carrying out the destruction of constitutional governments anywhere in the world was a group called the Jesuit Order. Clemens von Metternich, who was the leader of Austria, according to Samuel Morse, Metternich felt that the Jesuits would be just the group of people who could destroy popular government. Now I ask you, in 1814 and 1815, can you think of some power that was granting to its people certain inalienable rights that the Jesuits would go after? The greatest nemesis of the Jesuit order would be the United States. Of America. Now, in a book written by Eliot called The Diplomatic Code on page 179, he's quoting Senator Robert Owen, who made this statement in 1916. Listen carefully. The Holy Alliance. Now, let me state to you what the Holy Alliance was. The Holy Alliance was a phrase that was coined after the Congress of Vienna to describe the gathering together of Russia, Germany, Austria, and Pope Pius VII. They allied themselves together to destroy constitutional government, and they called it the Holy Alliance. It was certainly an alliance, but it was not holy. The Holy Alliance, having destroyed the popular government in Spain and Italy, had well laid plans to destroy popular government in the American colonies. It was because of this conspiracy against the American Republic by the European monarchies that the great English statesman Lord George Canning called the attention of our government to it. And our statesmen then, including Thomas Jefferson, took an active part to bring about the declaration by President James Monroe in his next annual message to the Congress of the United States. 
that the United States would regard it as an act of hostility to the government of the United States if any power of Europe ever undertook to establish upon the American continent any control or to acquire any territorial rights. This is the so-called Monroe Doctrine. The threat under the secret treaty of Verona to suppress popular government in the American republics is the basis of the Monroe Doctrine. You see, what happened was the Congress of Vienna met in 1814 and 1815, but that wasn't enough. So there was another Congress held in 1822. And at both of those Congresses, an English statesman by the name of George Canning was in attendance. George Canning realized that through the Congresses at Vienna and Verona, that the monarchies of Europe using the Jesuit order had one goal, and that was to annihilate the United States of America. And so George Kenning warned the United States statesmen, including Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson then wrote a letter of which I have a copy, which I'll read to you from momentarily. Jefferson wrote a letter to James Monroe, who was then the president, and he said, James, the monarchies of Europe want to destroy our republic. You've got to do something. And so James Monroe did. October 24th, excuse me, December of 1823, in which he issued his famous Monroe Doctrine. And Monroe's Doctrine was a response to the Congress at Vienna and Verona warning the monarchies of Europe and the Pope that if they ever tried to colonize in the Western Hemisphere, the United States government would look upon that as an act of war. Listen to Thomas Jefferson's letter written to James Monroe from Monticello, October 24, 1823. It says, Dear Sir, the question presented by the letters that you have sent to me is the most momentous which has ever been offered to my contemplation since that of independence. That made us a nation. This sets our compass and points the course which we are to steer through the ocean of time opening on us. And never could we embark on it under circumstances more auspicious. Our first and fundamental maxim should be never to entangle ourselves in the broils of Europe. Our second, never to allow Europe to intermeddle with cis-Atlantic affairs. America, North and South, has a set of interests distinct from those of Europe, and particularly her own. And then going on, Thomas Jefferson says, Nor is the occasion to be slighted when this proposition offers of declaring our protest against the atrocious violations of the rights of nations by the interference of any one in the internal affairs of another, so flagatiously begun by Napoleon Bonaparte and now continued by that equally lawless alliance calling itself holy. A little bit later on, Jefferson says, we will oppose the forcible interposition of any other power. I have been so long weaned from political subjects, Jefferson concludes, and have so long ceased to take any interest in them that I am sensible that I am not qualified to offer opinions on them worthy of any attention. What a humble man. But the question now proposed involves consequences so lasting and effects so decisive of our future destinies as to rekindle all the interest I have heretofore felt on such occasions and to induce me to the hazard of opinions, which will prove only my wish 
to contribute still my little might towards anything which may be useful to our country and praying you to accept it at only what it is worth. I add the assurance of my constant and affectionate friendship and respect. Thus were stated the words of the great president, Thomas Jefferson, ex-president at that time. If the Congresses of Vienna and Verona were not enough, after Monroe gave his Monroe Doctrine late in 1823, a few, about 15 months later, there was yet another Congress held. This one was to be held in a place called Cherie in northern Italy. There was a Jesuit college there at Cherie, and it was there that the Jesuit order met to plan exactly what they were going to be doing in the future. And to summarize the Congress at Cherie in 1825, they basically said, we are going to destroy Protestantism wherever it is found. We are going to take any constitutional government and we are going to subvert it and destroy it. They stated, Protestantism is becoming decomposed. It's falling to pieces. We are beginning to gain from it men of note. And there are even high personages whom we have succeeded in convincing that if they continue to uphold Protestantism, they are lost. Then the Bible, the authorized King James Version of 1611, that serpent which with head erect and eyes flashing threatens us with its venom while it trails along the ground, shall be changed into a rod as soon as we are able to seize it. So at the Congress of Cherie in 1825, Protestantism, constitutional Republican governments were to be destroyed, and the King James Version of the Bible was to be changed as soon as the Jesuits could get a hold of it. Have you ever wondered why we have so many different translations of the Bible today? It's because at the Congress of Cherie in 1825, the King James Version of the Bible, it was determined that the Jesuits would gather agents about them whom they could use to destroy the influence of the 1611 King James Version. And so James Monroe finished his presidency. And now we're going to turn and we're going to begin to analyze how the snakes of Rome began to wither their way through the grass of the United States and how they began to seek to destroy this great republic. The year was 1828. The man brought into the White House at that time was Andrew Jackson, known for his bravery and military skill in defeating the British at the War of 1812. Andrew Jackson was about to face another enemy, one that would not come at him with guns and cannons, but they would come slithering through the grass. They wouldn't come in open fields of combat. This foe would claim to be American just like him. They would claim to be wanting the best for America just like him. 
and they would occupy high positions of responsibility just like him. These snakes would slither amongst the American people and look just as American as everyone else until they would open their mouths. And then it would be clear they weren't American at all. They were tools of Rome, of the Jesuits, doing all they could to undermine the very foundation principles of this great land. The first two snakes confronted Andrew Jackson head on. Their names were John C. Calhoun and Nicholas Biddle. Now, Andrew Jackson won the presidency in 1828 by a very wide margin. His vice president was a man by the name of John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. Calhoun realized that the love for freedom was very strong in the hearts of America. He realized that slavery was rapidly being hemmed in because nearly all the territories purchased from Spain and France were free states. Calhoun realized that if slavery could not expand, it would eventually become a burden rather than a profit. So... Shortly after taking the chair of vice president in 1828, John C. Calhoun began writing a newspaper called the United States Telegraph. And in this paper, he began to advocate an idea called states' rights. If John C. Calhoun's idea was taken to its logical conclusion... Eventually, his idea would destroy the United States of America. Presuming that a state had an inherent right to leave the Union, which it did if the federal government became tyrannical, John C. Calhoun took a festering sore at that time and turned it into the reason why southern states could leave the Union of the United States. The festering sore that Calhoun took advantage of was a high tariff that had been placed on foreign imports which made European goods more expensive. Since European merchants one of them was Nathan Rothschild of England. They bought large amounts of southern cotton and other commodities. The high tariff meant that southern merchants made less money for their exports. This tax helped the northern manufacturer because now the southern merchant would have to buy more from him. Calhoun convinced the southern states that they were getting the raw end of the deal and that they had the right to leave the Union over this high tariff. Now in a book called The Adder's Den by John Smith Dye on page 22 of his book, he stated this, The South, being an agricultural region, was convinced that a high tariff on foreign imports was injurious to them. Calhoun undertook to explain to the South that these high duties were placed on specific articles and it was done to protect the North. He claimed that the South was being taxed to support Northern manufacturers. On this issue, Calhoun planted his nullification flag. Calhoun's idea meant the right to destroy, peaceably or by force, the federal union. So what John C. Calhoun simply did was, is he took an issue of the high tariff, which was making things coming in from Europe more expensive, 
And he said, if the South doesn't like this high tariff, then they have the right to leave the Union of States. What John C. Calhoun failed to realize and failed to admit was the very simple fact that if the law, the high tariff, was bad or wrong or unfair, then Congress, who made laws, had every right to look that law over again and overturn it if necessary. But what John C. Calhoun was doing underneath was he wanted to give every southern state the right to leave the Union of States for whatever reason they chose. And we'll see a few senators and people in the House of Representatives, famous men who opposed John C. Calhoun over this issue. After starting his paper, there was a meeting in honor of the memory of Thomas Jefferson, who had now died. At the gathering, Andrew Jackson was asked to speak, and he rose up and he said, Our federal union, it must be preserved. Andrew Jackson realized that Calhoun was seeking to undermine the union of states. Calhoun, right after Jackson at this same gathering, he rose up and he said, The union next to our liberties most dear. May we all remember that it can only be preserved by respecting the rights of the states and distributing equally the benefits and burdens of the Union. In John C. Calhoun's mind, the Union of States was put second to our liberties. The rights of the states were brought forth and placed above the Union, and that at any time, any state would have the right to secede from the United States for whatever reason they chose. It was obvious to many that John C. Calhoun was seeking to split the North and the South, and he was using the tariff in his attempt. And I want to remind you again of the statement of Charles Chiniqui, 50 Years in the Church of Rome, page 281. Rome saw at once that the very existence of the United States was a formidable menace to her own life. From the very beginning, she perfidiously sowed the germs of division and hatred between the two great sections of this country. In dividing south from north on the burning question of slavery. Charles Chiniqui stated, that Rome sought to sow the germs of division and hatred between the North and the South. What was John C. Calhoun doing with his doctrine of states' rights and saying that a country had the right to secede from the Union over a high tariff or anything that they chose? John C. Calhoun was sowing the germs of division and hatred between the North and the South. Daniel Webster, quoting from John Smith Dye's book again, The Adder's Den, page 25, a famous congressman stated this to John C. Calhoun, Sir, the world will scarcely believe that this whole controversy and all the desperate means which its support requires has no other foundation than a difference of opinion between a majority of the people of South Carolina on the one side and a vast majority of the people of the United States on the other. The world will not credit the fact. We who hear and see it can ourselves hardly yet believe it. Daniel Webster knew that the issue went far deeper than a tariff. 
John C. Calhoun was the Jesuit plant being used to split America in two. John Quincy Adams in the House of Representatives declared from Dye's book again, page 25, in opposition to the compromise of Mr. Clay, no victim is necessary and yet you propose to bind us hand and foot to pour out our blood upon the altar to appease the unnatural discontent of the South, a discontent having deeper root than the tariff and will continue when that is forgotten. John Quincy Adams made it very, very clear that there was a much deeper issue in the mind of John C. Calhoun. It went much deeper than a high tariff. And when the high tariff was forgotten, a much deeper, deeper issue was at stake. And Charles Chinnick, we made it very clear what that was, and that was the splitting of the North and the South. I don't have the page number right off, but in G. Edward Griffin's book called The Creature from Jekyll Island or The Creature of Jekyll Island, Griffin makes it very, very clear that the European bankers, the Rothschilds, the Warburgs, they wanted to divide the North and the South for economic reasons because they believed that the United States together collectively could become such a powerful economic unit that it could even take over the Rothschilds and the Warburgs. And the Rothschilds and Warburgs wanted a piece of the pie. And so they had to split north and south for economic reasons. Andrew Jackson in his message to Congress in 1832 stated this, the right of the people of a single state to absolve themselves at will and without the consent of the other states from their most solemn obligations and hazard the liberties and happiness of millions comprising this nation cannot be acknowledged. Such authority is believed to be wholly repugnant to the principles upon which the government is constituted and the objects which it is expressly formed to obtain. Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams, and Daniel Webster understood very, very clearly that John C. Calhoun wanted to destroy this nation. John C. Calhoun was an American in name only. He was a Jesuit plant in this country using his skill and his power and his position to undermine and destroy this republic. Andrew Jackson, for his stand against John C. Calhoun, was making some enemies. The second man, the second Jesuit agent in the United States that sought to destroy this nation was a man by the name of Nicholas Biddle. Nicholas Biddle was a brilliant financier having graduated from the University of Pennsylvania at the age of 13. He was a master of the secret science of money. By the time Jackson came to the presidency in 1828, Nicholas Biddle was in full control of the federal government's central bank. Now, this was not the first time that a central bank had been established. Twice before, first under Robert Morris during the Revolution, a central bank had been attempted 
but because of the selfishness and greed of Morris and his cohorts, the central bank failed. After, after the American Revolution, Alexander Hamilton tried it again. It failed again for the same reason. After the War of 1812, this was a, another attempt to have a central bank, a Federal Reserve Bank, if you will. And it was in this third attempt that we find Mr. Biddle. Who was behind Nicholas Biddle and the attempt to have a central bank in the United States? From the book, The Creature of Jekyll Island by G. Edward Griffin, page 331, we read these words. The blunt reality is that the Rothschild banking dynasty in Europe was the dominant force financially and politically in the formation of the bank of the United States. In another book called Rothschild, The Wealth and Power of a Dynasty by Derek Wilson on page 178, we read these words. Over the years since Rothschild, the Manchester textile manufacturer had bought cotton from the southern states, Rothschilds had developed heavy American commitments. Nathan Rothschild had made loans to various states of the Union and was a pledged supporter of the Bank of the United States. One other book by Gustavus Myers called History of the Great American Fortunes, page 556. He says this, The Rothschilds long had a powerful influence in dictating American financial laws. The law records show that they were the power in the old bank of the United States. Now Griffin, Derek Wilson, and Gustavus Myers have all made it very, very clear that the power behind the central bank of the United States was the Rothschilds of Europe. Now I ask you, who was behind the Rothschilds? Who were the Rothschilds working for? If we can find out who the Rothschilds were working for, then we can know conclusively who was pulling Nicholas Biddle's strings as well. Because Biddle was working for the Rothschilds. He was the controller of the central bank in the United States and the Rothschilds of Europe controlled the central bank of the United States so they controlled Nicholas Biddle. Now who were the Rothschilds working for? Let me read it to you from F. Tupper Saucy's book called Rulers of Evil. Pages 160 and 161 we read these words. The Rothschilds bear the title Guardians of the Vatican Treasury. The appointment of Rothschild gave the Black Papacy or the Jesuit Order absolute financial privacy and secrecy. Who would ever search a family of Orthodox Jews for the key to the wealth of the Roman Catholic Church? Who controlled the Rothschilds? Who controlled Nicholas Biddle? And who was behind the central bank of the United States? Saucy tells us it was the Jesuits of Rome. Now the Rothschilds understood a principle and the Jesuit order understood a principle and it's a quote from Mayor Rothschild Creature of Jekyll Island page 218 G. Edward Griffin's book it says this let me issue and control a nation's money and I care not who writes the laws 
Now, why would Mayor Amschild Rothschild make such a statement as that? Give me control of a nation's finances and I don't care who writes the laws. It's very simply for this reason. If you control the money, then you can control who takes office and you can control the media that influences the people who vote for people to go into office. Rothschild and the Jesuits understood that if they controlled the money of the United States through a central bank, that they could eventually take over and have every congressman in their hip pocket and then they could rewrite the laws of this nation and destroy the Constitution. That is the Jesuits' Rothschild's golden rule. The one who has the gold rules. From Herman Cross's book, Documentary History of Banking and Currency in the United States, pages 26 and 27, Andrew Jackson said this, Is there no danger to our liberty and independence in a bank that in its nature has so little to bind it to our country? Is there not cause to tremble for the purity of our elections in peace and for the independence of our country in war? controlling our currency, receiving our public monies, holding thousands of our citizens in dependence. It would be more formidable and dangerous than a naval and military power of the enemy. Andrew Jackson was scared to death about the power that Nicholas Biddle, under the control of foreign investors, held over politicians, and over the United States. From G. Edward Griffin's book again, quoting Thomas Jefferson, Jefferson understood this too. He said, a private central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army. We must not let our rulers load us with perpetual debt. Tragically, the words of Jackson and Jefferson were left unheeded. And in 1910, the Federal Reserve System of the United States was set up again. And what do we have today? Perpetual debt. Right around 1831, as Andrew Jackson began to seek for re-election, Nicholas Biddle thought it was the perfect time to get a renewal of the central bank's charter. Nicholas Biddle did not think that Andrew Jackson would oppose the attempt at a new charter for the central bank. He thought that Jackson would not want to do that because it would hurt his re-election bid. But Andrew Jackson was not of the same ilk as Nicholas Biddle. Andrew Jackson was a man of courage who was not controlled by other people. So Andrew Jackson vetoed Congress's attempt to give a renewal to the central bank. Biddle responded to Jackson's veto and he began to contract the nation's monetary supply. By contracting the amount of money in circulation, Biddle upended the economy and money was disappearing. Unemployment was running high. Companies were going bankrupt because they couldn't pay their loans. The nation went into a panic depression. Biddle felt that he could force Andrew Jackson to keep the central bank. He was so confident that he publicly boasted that he had caused the economic woes in the United States. 
Due to his foolish bragging, others came out in defense of Andrew Jackson, and the Central Bank of the United States died. Tragically, tragically, 75 years later, in 1910, many men, seven to be exact, met at a place off the coast of Georgia called Jekyll Island. And it was at Jekyll Island right around the year 1910 that representatives of three very, very powerful families determined to reestablish a central bank in the United States. The three families represented at Jekyll Island in the early 1900s were representatives of the Rothschilds, representatives of J.P. Morgan, and representatives of the Rockefellers. And those three groups, those three families met there at Jekyll Island to establish the Federal Reserve System. And we still have that creature with us today. We can tell conclusively that the central bank attempts at the time of the revolution, at the time after the revolution, at the time after the war of 1812, and then finally in the early 1900s have all been attempts by the Rothschilds and particularly the Jesuit order to take control and to strangle the United States of America. The Jesuit scheming to divide this nation through John C. Calhoun was stopped during Andrew Jackson's presidency. The attempts of Nicholas Biddle and the Rothschilds and Jesuits to continue to strangle the United States through controlling our finances, that also was stopped by Andrew Jackson. And so now we see the Jesuit oath come into play. Because anybody that would dare to oppose the plans and operations of the Jesuits, no matter what position they might occupy, it would become a meritorious work to murder someone who would stand in their way. And so it should not surprise us to read in G. Edward Griffin's book, The Creature of Jekyll Island, on page 357, these words. The president had earned the undying hatred of monetary scientists, both in America and abroad. It is not surprising, therefore, that on January 30th, 1835, an assassination attempt was made against him. Miraculously, both pistols of the assailant misfired, and Jackson was spared by a quirk of fate. It was the first such attempt to be made against the life of a president of the United States. The would-be assassin was Richard Lawrence, who boasted to friends that, had, that he had been in touch with powerful people in Europe who had promised to protect him from punishment should he be caught. Lawrence was found not guilty due to his sanity. So Richard Lawrence sought to kill Andrew Jackson, who stood in the way of the Jesuits' plan 
to split this nation in two and to control the finances of this nation. Richard Lawrence told friends, boasted to friends, according to Griffin, that if he was caught, these powerful men of Europe would somehow set him free. And so Richard Lawrence was put on trial and he was gotten off due to insanity. The Jesuit order was dead serious on taking over the United States. What happened in Vienna in 1814 and 1815? What happened in Verona in 1822 and then what was finalized in 1825 at the Congress at Cherie, the Jesuit order was dead serious on taking over and destroying the United States. They would infiltrate into government at the highest of levels or would use their agents in controlling the American banking system. They would also use assassination when necessary to destroy any opposition to their plans. Andrew Jackson was almost assassinated by a Jesuit plant who bragged of powerful Europeans that would set him free in case he was caught. As we have found in our series on Behind the Door, Andrew Jackson was the first, but he most certainly was not the last. The Jesuit order was going to do whatever was necessary. Jackson was almost killed. Harrison was, Taylor was, Buchanan almost, Lincoln was. And anybody who got in her way would be removed, as was John F. Kennedy in 1963. As you and I look today over the horizon of the United States, and we see a central bank in place again with Alan Greenspan and the Federal Reserve. May God help each one of us to be willing to ever follow in the footsteps of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we ever choose to stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us and to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few. May God help us to ever stand and be ready to do His bidding in this world. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, the Jesuits were dead serious on carrying out their father's business. Help us to be dead serious on carrying out our heavenly father's business. In Jesus' name. Amen.